All right, thanks everyone for coming to the CHEP seminar this week. Uh, we have Amanda Hagan here joining us from Rutgers University. Uh, Amanda is a labor economist who does work in the economics of crime. Uh, she is an assistant professor and has already published in the top journals in the field, the Quarterly Journal of Economics, the Review of Economics and Statistics, uh, Journal of Law and Economics, Journal of Human Resources, uh, the AER Papers and Proceedings, and I'm really excited for her to present uh, this paper today, which has received a ton of press on misdemeanor prosecution. Thanks Great. so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you for this lovely day. To those of you I've gotten a chance to meet, um, it was really wonderful. For those of you I didn't get a chance to meet, hopefully we get a chance to talk um, at some point in the future. Um, so yes, I'm presenting this work today um, about misdemeanor prosecution. This is joint work with Jen Doliak at Texas A&M, who you just might be familiar with, um, and Anna Harvey, who is a political scientist at New York University. This was working just a second ago. I swear to God, I tested it. <laughs> what? Oh. There we go. Okay, got it. Perfect. Okay. So let's see. Okay. All right. So by way of background and motivation for why we're thinking about prosecuting misdemeanors, charging individuals with misdemeanors, um, is that, you know, you may have heard this estimate that one third of Americans have some type of criminal record. Now, that comes from the FBI's kind of III database, which is everybody who's been booked and fingerprinted in the United States, about one third of people have been booked and fingerprinted at some point, right? Not all of those arrests are going to lead to criminal charges or criminal court charges, but a lot of them are going to. Once something has led to a criminal court charge, it's going to be very easily searchable on an employer's background check, background checks that landlords are doing, and things of this nature. And a lot of these offenses that people are being charged with are misdemeanors, right? Nearly 80% of criminal charges in the United States are misdemeanors. These are lower level crimes as compared to felonies, the sort of thing that we might hear a lot more about in the media or have done a lot more research about felony crimes make up only about 20% of criminal charges in the United States. And a lot of these misdemeanor charges will actually end up in dismissal. In fact, a plurality of criminal charges in the United States tend to end in a dismissal, right? You've probably heard the statistic that 95% of uh, convictions come from plea bargains, but that's amongst convictions of charges, right? A lot of them are going to be resolved through dismissal. But even those non-convictions show up on a background check and follow somebody around, right? There are collateral consequences to even a non-conviction, which can show up on a background check for about seven years. Um, according to federal law. And so recently across the country, we've had a state of reform-minded uh, district attorneys who have been elected who are implementing policies to increase leniency and reduce charging for certain nonviolent misdemeanor crimes to help these individuals avoid the mark of a criminal record um, and also to kind of save money in terms of court costs uh, fines, fees, and punishment. But as you can imagine, there has been a lot of pushback from law enforcement and potentially from some of the local community who are wary of the safety implications of choosing to stop charging certain types of nonviolent misdemeanors. Okay. So, what do we think about what the potential impacts of prosecuting somebody, um, and particularly for our context, prosecuting somebody for a nonviolent misdemeanor crime? Right? Well, we think on the one hand, and some people hope, that there's going to be a specific deterrent effect of this sort of prosecution. If I get prosecuted for this crime, right, I'm going to learn that I can get caught for this kind of crime. I'm going to learn what the potential punishments are or actually experience what those punishments are. And that may make me less likely to commit this sort of crime in the future. And we see some evidence for specific deterrence effects of this type. Um, with certain types of low-level crimes. So Ben Hansen, um, in the paper in 2015, uh, found that individuals who had an increased punishment for DUI were less likely to go on to commit a DUI in the future. And similarly, in a recent paper by Dusik and Traxler, they find similar evidence for speeding punishments, that higher speeding punishments are actually reducing the probability that somebody ends up with a speeding ticket in the future. Right? On the other hand, I just mentioned that even misdemeanor dismissal can follow you around. They cause a line on your criminal background check. And we know that there are tons of collateral consequences in the United States to have a criminal record, right? The damage of that criminal record can work through employers, employers who are reluctant to even call back 
an individual who has a criminal record, and this is true even in an audit study from Mugen and co-authors, for misdemeanor arrests, right? Not even for convictions, employers are less likely to call those individuals back, right? Law enforcement, now being able to see that you are the type of person that has a criminal record, maybe more likely to arrest you or more likely to prosecute you for future criminal legal contact, right? And so it's kind of trade-off between this potential specific deterrent effect and all of these collateral consequences of ending up with a criminal record or ending up with additional lines on your criminal record, which could actually increase recidivism, right? If you lack opportunity, right, you may be then more likely to go on and commit further crimes. Just a, just a thing, it's just, how much detail is provided on sort of the standard background check about yeah. the prior offense? So to what, what kind yeah. of information will, so will you, an employer yeah. see you? Yeah, it's only too, it's almost too bad because I'm doing a different project on, on criminal background checks more specifically, in which I actually have a picture uh, of a background check, but I don't have it in this particular presentation. Um, but basically what you would see is something like uh, the what the name of the crime is. So whatever it happens to be in that jurisdiction, larceny theft, misdemeanor, dismissed or larceny theft, felony, convicted. And then you'll see the date of the conviction. You won't usually see information about the punishment that was levied um, because the data that we're, uh, background check agencies are using come from court records and not from Department of Corrections data. Um, so usually you're just seeing information about the name of the crime, the level of the crime, whether it was a conviction or a dismissal or whatever the adjudication outcome was and the date of that particular um, outcome. Okay, um, and then in the kind of most similarly related paper um, is a paper by Mike Mueller-Smith and Kevin Schnappel, which studies deferred adjudication in Texas for felony crimes. So deferred adjudication is a little bit different than just choosing not to prosecute. In a deferred adjudication, an individual pleads basically guilty to the crime, and then the judge says, if you complete this probationary period or these particular restrictions, and you kind of successfully completed at the end with no additional crime, then we will dismiss your case, okay? And so they find, uh, you know, using a, an identification strategy involving some policy changes, um, they find that getting a deferred adjudication in Texas reduces recidivism for felony defendants and increases labor market participation, right? Or put differently, right, not getting this sort of deferred adjudication would increase uh, the probability that somebody recidivates, the sort of collateral consequences there may be outweighing the potential specific deterrent of that. But we're going to be studying kind of not even choosing to charge a misdemeanor defendant, where again, we think the felonies are important, but the misdemeanors are making up a vast majority of the criminal legal system in the United States. Um, again, about 80% of criminal court charges. And a lot of the policies nowadays are about kind of specific non-prosecution, not necessarily with any sort of restrictions or probationary. Okay. Okay, so the exact research question that we'll be thinking about is what is the impact of non-prosecution of, let's just say, non-violent misdemeanor offenses on subsequent criminal justice contact for the impacted defendants, right? So we're looking specifically at a defendant who gets that sort of leniency, what's going to happen to their future recidivism risk, their future criminal justice contact. In order to answer this question, we're going to be using case management records um, from Suffolk County, where Boston, Massachusetts is located. What's useful for us about these case management records from the district attorney's office is kind of is kind of two things as compared to the sort of court records that you might be able to more easily scrape, download, or FOIA, is that we can see information about complaints. A complaint is basically arrest, an arrest in Massachusetts. Uh, it's a little bit of a technical difference, but think about it as an arrest. We can see information on complaints that came into the district attorney's office that the district attorney just declined to charge. Right, criminal court data is going to include all cases that were prosecuted, right? But we're going to miss those ones that at the very initial moment, the district attorney's office said, no, we're not charging this, right? But because they take it into their intake and into their case management system, we can see information about those charges. That's going to be super important to us, otherwise we couldn't study this particular juncture. And what we also have is identifying information for the assistant district attorney, the line prosecutor that made the decision about whether we should charge this case or not. Okay? You can sometimes see prosecutorial information in criminal court records. Usually what you're seeing is the prosecutor that made the decision at the final uh, moment of adjudication, whatever that final adjudication was. If it was a conviction, the prosecutor who worked during the conviction, if it was a dismissal, the prosecutor who made the decision on the dismissal. In Suffolk County, a different prosecutor makes the decision on that initial charging decision than makes later court case decisions. 
So if we only had those later court case decisions, we wouldn't know who made that initial decision about whether to charge the case. And that's gonna be very key to our identification strategy. Right? Obviously we can't just be comparing not prosecuted cases to prosecuted cases because those two types of cases are likely to be very different on both observable characteristics and also on unobservable characteristics, right? And so in order to understand the impacts of non-prosecution on future criminal legal contact, we are going to be exploiting the fact that the assistant district attorney who makes that initial decision is as if randomly assigned to that particular defendant. It's not a literal bingo ball, right? It's not a literal kind of random assignment process, but it mimics a random assignment process in ways that I will describe when we talk a little bit more about the institutional details. So if you've ever read a judge fixed effects or judge IV paper, this is all gonna sound very familiar, right? We're gonna go through a lot of the same exercises. I told myself I would never write a judge ID paper because there was tons of them already. So I didn't, I wrote a prosecutor ID paper instead. <laughs> but really it's gonna feel very familiar and all of the same sort of issues will, will come up for us as well. And we'll go through all of those in turn as we begin to, to um, present the results. But that's why using these sort of case management records from the district attorney's office rather than criminal court data is gonna be really key for us to get at this initial juncture, at this initial decision about whether to move forward with prosecuting a case or not and understand the impact on those marginal defendants of that non-prosecution. So, so the, the, I'm sure you're gonna sort of chat about how the, the, the late could be yes, sort of a little, a little, a little different yep. here versus what we think about the, the lates from randomized punishment yep. versus judges. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we'll, I mean, okay. we'll talk a little, so this is going to give us a local average treatment effect, right? The treatment effect for those marginal defendants, the defendants for whose decision or whose outcomes could actually be different if they were assigned to a harsher ADA versus a lenient ADA, which is the variation that we're going to be exploiting here, right? Some of these ADAs are more likely to not prosecute cases. Some of them are more likely to prosecute them. And we're going to be, you know, kind of using that as our instrument, but it is going to give us kind of a very specific local average treatment effect. Now, we think it's particularly policy relevant here because most of the policies, most of the non-prosecution policies are what's called a presumption of non-prosecution. That means the default is non-prosecution, but you can still prosecute. You just need to kind of push a little bit harder. So in some sense, it's just moving the leniency lever a little bit, which is kind of what this sort of it's only gonna it's only gonna impact the marginal defendants. The kind of always takers and never takers, even in a presumption of non-prosecution, are still gonna be always takers and never takers. Um, so we do think it is particularly interesting, even in the policy context, you know, but it is still giving us the impact for a particular set of dependents. We'll also look toward the end of the paper um, at the inauguration of Rachel Rollins at the beginning of January 2019. She ran on a platform of presumption of non-prosecution for certain nonviolent misdemeanors. So that's going to significantly expand leniency in this particular jurisdiction. And then we'll look to see, okay, do results look similar, even with this large expansion of leniency that might go beyond what we could see in our particular paper. And we're going to end up seeing actually remarkably similar results, uh, but we'll go over those toward the end. And we'll talk a little bit about how to interpret the lead and what proportion of our sample is compliers and what the compliers look like, um, hopefully. <laughs> Great. Sometimes I can't tell people are scratching their heads or asking questions. But, uh, and people on Zoom, you should just unmute yourself and ask questions if you have them at any time. I can't see you or anything. Go ahead. So there is a district attorney that all of these ADAs work for. Yes. And they presumably set policy, and this is a change in policy we were sharing with you. Yeah. Any would have policy about which sort of cases to pursue and which ones to not. Does the scale of variation in the behavior of the ADA surprise you or would it surprise the boss? Um, that's a really good question. So two, two ways to think about that. First, to, to let you know, there was only one. So the main time period we'll focus on is 2000, 2018, pre the election of Rachel Rollins. And that's mainly because we need outcome periods for the potential recidivism of the defendants. And there was only one district attorney during this time period, Dan Conley, who worked that this, this entire period. So there's no change in policy through this time period, although of course he himself may have changed policy. Um, I think I can tell you um, that they were initially kind of surprised by the amount of variation in leniency. And in fact, if you talk to if you talk to several of these sort of ADAs, if you talk to the uh, the ADAs, they will at first sort of like really push back against this idea that like everybody is just trying to like in the interest of justice do their jobs, and nobody is thinking about anything outside of exactly what's in front of them. And there's no way that there would be everybody's going to be making decisions very similarly, right? And then they start to tell stories. 
right? And then they start to tell you, oh, well, there was this one kid, you know, he came in, he had a drug addicted mother, you know, he had just stolen something, but like, I couldn't sit there and prosecute this kid given these circumstances and the light bulb goes off, right? Oh, wait, maybe I am sometimes making discretionary decisions and I actually do have colleagues that might make different discretionary decisions in this particular instance. Um, but they're not, they were not tracking this information. Like they were not tracking like what proportion of cases any additional, uh, any ABA was prosecuting or not prosecuting. The individual ADAs also really had no connection to the case leader and had no concept of like what the recidivism rate of the cases that they were choosing to prosecute or not prosecute was, or even really what the conviction rate of women they were choosing to prosecute or not prosecute, which is even more surprising because that might be the direct thing that they should be thinking about. But in our particular instance, the ADA who makes the initial decision doesn't make the final decision. And there wasn't like, there's not a lot of data analytics going on during this time period. They're starting to do more of that now as we've tried to show them some of the power of what they can do here. Um, but a lot of it is just kind of anecdote that they're gleaning, um, but not a lot of data. Always surprises me a little bit. All right, so to talk a little bit about kind of exactly what we're talking about, this is a schematic of the sequence of events in the criminal justice system. It is not specific to Suffolk County, and I apologize if you don't need, you don't really necessarily need to understand um, each of these points, but I just want to try to tell you the, the, the kind of juncture of the criminal legal process that we're focusing on, right? As we think about the sequence of events in the criminal justice system, clearly to start with, a crime has to have occurred, right? Somebody needs to report it, see it, try to start an investigation, uh, potentially arrest somebody and book somebody, right? Fingerprint them, take them in to potentially get charged. All of these first steps happen with the police. And then at some point the police have decided, yes, I want to arrest and book and hope to charge, I hope the prosecutor will charge this individual. And they bring them to the prosecutor's office, potentially physically, potentially just as a file holder, just to come to the jurisdiction, right? And then at that point, the district attorney's office gets to make an initial decision about whether they're going to prosecute the case or not, right? And then after they do that, right, a whole bunch of things might may or may not happen that we're not going to be studying. But we're going to be studying this decision at the initial appearance in the district attorney's office about whether the charges should be dropped or whether prosecution should occur, okay? And in Suffolk, this moment is called arraignment. Okay, in every jurisdiction, it might be a little different. This actually does require the defendant to show up. The defendant comes to the arraignment hearing. The prosecutor is there. Whatever line prosecutor happens to be assigned to that court on that day, they have a stack of paper files in front of them with the evidence from the police for which they have to make kind of quick decisions on whether to choose to prosecute this case or dismiss this case. Okay? Yeah, go ahead. So, and you might be talking about this, but it seems that your, your identification really hinges on kind of this moment right here mm -hmm. and kind of how that arises. Mm -hmm. Is it the case that police officers may know that there's this variation? Police officers <laughs> may strategically yeah. time when they submit. So they may know, it's possible that they would know, but what they wouldn't know is who's going to be assigned to do prosecutions on any particular day. There's not like a calendar outside of the courtroom. Okay, so they can't that be says, like, you know, Joe lets everyone off. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm sick of these guys getting off. Yeah. I'm, I'm not going to Joe, I'm going to bring it to Chicago. Right, no, you can't do that. So there's yeah. no choice on the particular day the person comes in. There's no choice about which prosecutor is going to take the, the case uh, or make the decision on that particular case. And there's also legal requirements about how fast somebody who's arrested needs to be brought to this arraignment hearing, which is 48 hours, um, unless it's a weekend, in which case it can be 72. Um, and so there's really not gonna be a lot of leeway for the police officer to try to juggle around um, what prosecutor's gonna make this decision. And similarly, there's not a lot of room for the defendant or the defendant's attorney to try to juggle around this information because there's not Shoshana and Joe working at the same time and you get to choose a courtroom. There's one arraignment courtroom, right? There's one prosecutor making decisions, potentially two, but like, there's one set of people making decisions and that's who's making decisions in the cases that walk in that day. And you can't ask for like, can I make it my decision tomorrow or something like that. And you're brought in basically the day after or the day you are arrested. Yeah. Okay, so we're gonna be defining non-prosecution as a case that is closed at or prior to arraignment with a dismiss without a conviction. I'll define, I'll tell you why I'm talking about at or prior to arraignment in just a second. And then prosecution is going to be basically case, any case that continues to any moment past arraignment. It also includes a very, very small proportion of individuals who basically said, yes, I did it. 
and they plead guilty at that moment. At that moment, they have a conviction, so we're going to consider them prosecuted. We can drop them and, and not go to jail. So outer prior to arraignment is actually going to be kind of important for us in terms of thinking about mechanism. So in the state of Massachusetts, the moment of arraignment actually happens when the judge says your name and you walk up to basically the podium and they you start telling you about your charges and everything like that. That is the moment you are arraigned. The prosecutor, however, is getting that stack of files in the morning when they're in the courtroom. And they sometimes just kind of go through them and they say, I'm not, there's no way I'm charging this, right? And so they may charge you actually prior to the moment that you stepped in front of the judge. But this is also important because the moment a case can end up with a line in the official state criminal justice repository is at the moment of arraignment. So if you are arraigned, right, then there is supposed to be a record of this case in the decedent system. Right, and then that's the system that employers are getting background check information from, landlords are getting background check information from, future prosecutors, police officers, and everything like that. Right. So unfortunately, the data doesn't tell us when exactly in the day your case was dismissed. Right. What we know is that it was closed on the same day that your arraignment hearing was. Right. So we won't actually get to define this part, but you're going to see later that a case that is not prosecuted is like fifty percent more than 50% less likely to end up in the deceitous repository, okay? So that's why that part is important. It occurs to me, I thought I had a preview of results slide and I don't see it. So I'm just gonna tell you because I realize we're having a conversation that is gonna be a lot clearer when you're thinking about the results. Now, I know you all read the paper all at 86 pages. So in some sense, I don't have to tell you. But what we're going to find is that for the marginal defendant, non-prosecution, leniency actually reduces the probability that they're going to recidivate in the future. And so that's why exactly I'm talking about this moment, because we think about this as one of the main driving mechanisms, is now you are very much, you're very less likely to have any information about this criminal legal contact on your criminal background check, right? So you avoid the collateral consequences um, of this particular charge, and that's likely to be one of the driving mechanisms behind this reduction in recidivism. So in Suffolk County, uh, during our time period between 2000 and 2018, about 21% of the nonviolent misdemeanor cases are not prosecuted. Okay, so about one in five cases. It's a good amount. It's not like this never happens, but it's also not like this always happens. And of course, you're going to see that there's significant variation across ADAs in the proportion of cases that are not prosecuted. So the first thing we could do, sort of naively, is to just compare the recidivism rates of those defendants who are prosecuted with those defendants who are not prosecuted. We'll define recidivism in three ways throughout this paper, but we'll mainly focus on the first one. Actually, we'll define it in more than three ways because we also have time variation, but regardless. Um, so we'll mainly focus on what is the probability the defendant ends up with another criminal complaint that is another arrest within two years in Suffolk County, right? We're relying basically on do you show up as another row in our data set um, within the next two years. We'll also look about whether your case is actually prosecuted sometime in the next two years. And then we also have data from the DeCija system. Unfortunately, we didn't get access to it directly, but they allowed the Suffolk County Prosecutor's Office to merge uh, their data with the DeCija data. That gives us a little bit more of a statewide uh, information on recidivism, because everything here is Suffolk County specific, but whether you end up with the future DeCija record is more statewide. So we'll also look at that as a potential form um, of recidivism. And so what you'll see is that prosecuted defendants are more likely to recidivate than non-prosecuted defendants, right? But as you can imagine, right, prosecuted cases, right, are also very different, at least on observable characteristics, than non-prosecuted cases, right? Cases that are prosecuted endogenously um, have more counts associated with them. The defendants are more likely to have had a conviction um, in the previous year. Um, they're more likely to be charged with what we're calling victimless crimes. Right, so think about drug possession, some sorts of minor disorderly conduct, not theft, right? Theft would have a, a, a defense of a victim who may actually want to show up at court. Um, those victimless crimes are, are more likely to be not prosecuted, right? And so it's kind of part and parcel of why we're going to need an identification strategy here to understand the causal impacts of non prosecution on recidivism. So, how we're going to do this, you know, we're going to use the fact, we're going to use the kind of assignment mechanism of the ABAs um, as an instrument. So there are nine courthouses in Suffolk County. So like Boston Municipal Court, Brighton, Chelsea, Roxbury, nine different courthouses. Line prosecutors, ADAs, are assigned to one of those courtrooms. They just work in one courthouse, 
but I only, I'm a prosecutor in the Boston Municipal Court. Once I'm there, I, I'm going to be assigned sometimes to do arraignments, right? So there are several courtrooms within the courthouse. One of those courtrooms is dedicated to doing these arraignment hearings, okay? Sometimes I'm going to be told that it is my particular week or my particular couple of days to cover arraignments. When I do that, I'm taking every single case that walks into the courtroom. I have no choice about it. You have no choice to try to kind of manipulate this decision as we were talking about before. I've given a lot of these details to you already, um, but you know, if what's also important for us is that if the case is prosecuted, the paper file goes into a stack in like the head ADA's office, and they then go assign that to a different prosecutor who will see the case through. Uh, to the completion. You know, sometimes it might be you, but that's not because you prosecuted the case, right? It's because you're kind of up next in whatever the, the rotation system might be. And so we'll show you some evidence, obviously empirically, you know, that we think this is basically a random assignment process. You know, we've also done a lot of qualitative interviewing with the ADAs, try to asking point blank questions, like could you have ever made a decision to not prosecute a case? Somebody used an expletive blank, no. Of course, I couldn't make that sort of decision. Like I was just looking at whatever cases were coming in. Um, on that particular day. Um, so we're gonna then use, we're gonna construct our instrumental variable as basically the ADA's average rate of non-prosecution for nonviolent misdemeanors, okay? But as you can imagine, different types of cases might come into different courthouses. Boston Municipal is gonna see different kinds of cases than Brighton, right? And so we might see what looks like higher leniency amongst ADAs in Brighton than Boston Municipal Court, but that's coming from the case characteristics in those places and not the ADA's like residual leniency, right? Also months of the year are gonna have different types of crimes coming in. They're gonna be a little different around December than they're gonna be in the middle of the summer. Days of the week also similarly. Crimes that come in on Monday are all crimes from over the weekend, right? Crimes that are coming in on Thursday are Wednesday night crimes, right? They're likely to be different, right? And so we'll basically use court by month. We'll residualize out the court by month and court by day of week fixed effects so that we're kind of better comparing ADAs that are looking at a similar set of cases. And we will construct a leave out mean uh, for those residualized kind of ADA averages. That is, we're gonna not include the defendant's own case when we're constructing the ADA's mean because we don't want the defendant's outcome on both the left-hand side and the right-hand side of the equation. I always think in practice, it doesn't really matter with this many cases, but we'll make sure that we handle uh, the situation. Okay. So we have 315 uh, ADAs that are making decisions over this time period. They spend on average about 83 days out of their three and a half years um, as an ADA arraigning cases. So it's a little different than like the bail magistrate or bail judge case where basically that's what they're doing every day, right? This isn't necessarily what these ADAs are doing every day. They sometimes have later part of cases that they've been assigned to, right? So they're doing this sometimes, but not every single day. Um, in, in our data set, the median, a uh, number of nonviolent misdemeanor complaints that ADA makes decisions on is 156. The mean is 214. So we have a lot of observations for each of these ADAs in which to compute this mean. It's not like five cases that might be idiosyncratically different. And we're going to call this ADA leniency. So first, I'm going to show you the raw leniency distribution. So this doesn't residualize out the court by week or court by court by month or court by day of week fixed effects because it's easier to understand, right, than the residualized version. I'll show you that in just a second. But this is what the variation looks like, right? On average, right, we have about 21% uh, of cases not being prosecuted uh, by a particular ADA. But, you know, on the harsher side of the distribution, there's some ADAs that are not prosecuting like 5% of the cases uh, that they see, non violent misdemeanor cases. And on the lenient side, there's some ADAs that are not prosecuting nearly 50% of the cases um, that come in front of them. Although a lot of them are sort of clustered uh, more around 20%. Are you you know, planning a follow up paper where you actually look at? Mm -hmm. This what causes this, this variation? Yeah. Without, like, it first? Oh wait, that's tell me one more time. Are you are you thinking? Are you considering a follow up paper where you look and just explain this? Yes, this yes, yes, there, yes. Like the cross sectional yes. variation, cross Yeah, yeah. No, I would, I would, I would really like to do. It. We've been talking about it. I'm not sure. Plan talking about <laughs> uh, planning is maybe a different thing. Um, but it would be really interesting to look at what some of the correlations are. You know, just between the sort of leniency and the characteristics of the EDA. Right now, we actually don't have a lot of characteristics in them, so that's part of the issue is we're, we're trying to get data from like the bar associations and where, John, where they went to law school, how long they've actually been barred for um, gender, race, things of that nature. Right now, we have basically have an ID for the EDA. Okay, 
How do they feel about you doing that? I mean, I, I, you know, I thought my point before is the district attorney should want to see the results. Yes, they do. Um, she does. Um, how do they feel? Okay, so the one, the problem is there's a bit of selection in who we get to talk to, right? So the ADAs that are willing to talk to us are also probably the ones that are very supportive of this research. So I don't know. There's like maybe new ones out there um, that aren't so supportive. Like we've talked to them about doing additional kind of experimentation in like telling the ADA like, hey, look, there's this guy who doesn't prosecute like 40% of cases and also has a really low recidivism rate. You're down here at 10%. Like, why don't you be more like him kind of, right? But there's also kind of a lot of issues that, that have been in conversation with the office about how they don't, the ADAs are not gonna wanna be identified like in this sort of matrix, except maybe to themselves, but obviously they don't want the other ADAs to see. So that was very much an aside, but yeah. yeah. Okay, so what does this look like when we residualize it? So now this is kind of the same version of this variation, but residualize out because some of the variation here is going to be coming from the fact that cases are just different in different courts or in different time periods, right? So once we residualize this out, we're still seeing a significant amount of variation, right? So this histogram is showing you that going from the least lenient ADA to the most lenient ADA increases your probability of non-prosecution by about 18 percentage points. That's an 86% change over the average uh, of 21%. And we're also showing you kind of a non-parametric version of our first stage, right? If you get assigned to an ADA that's on this side of the histogram, you're more likely to be not prosecuted than if you get assigned to an ADA on this side, the harsh side of the histogram. Not surprising, right? But we're going to need that um, in order to actually use this as an instrument. We'll show you, obviously, the kind of table parametric version of our first stage in a second. Also. I'm curious. I understand this is a real residualized take yeah. care of these sort of differences in cases, but what we do do you have a sense of what types of sort of misdemeanors that you see the sort of widest kind of variation mm. in in in, uh, in prosecutions and, and yeah. in which you don't just to get a sense of what the yeah that's a good question so we have a little bit of trouble here so we have a lot of cases but still as we as we start to nail down different case types it becomes a lot harder so we've broken things down into four major case categories mm -hmm. I think I put them in the summer so just kind of didn't talk about them so we break them down into motor vehicle charges which is not like speeding, it's kind of more serious motor vehicle crimes, drug charges, disorderly theft, mostly because we just didn't have enough theft cases to do separately. And then we have this like amalgamation of other cases. So I haven't actually looked at what this distribution looks like across, across within these case types. We've done things like ADA by crime type instruments instead of just ADA instruments. You know, we don't think that there's a monotonicity violation here, but I haven't really done that. I think that would be interesting and descriptive to sort of understand if there's one sort of piece type in which there's a wider distribution. This would kind of go more to the second paper idea of trying to, under, trying to understand this variation in leniency, but I think it would be an interesting one. Okay, so lots of variation. Okay, so we want to use this as an IV. We want to interpret our IV as a local average treatment effect. Hopefully you've taken enough econometrics by now. Uh, to know that there are several assumptions that we're going to need um, in order to do this, in order to make this sort of um, late interpretation of our IV. So we're going to go through the evidence that we do have for these. Obviously, I can't prove a lot of them to you, but I can show you that we're fairly confident that they're going to hold in our particular case. Right, so the first is, you know, we want this thing to actually be sort of as if randomly assigned. We want it to be an exogenous decision. So in order to make ourselves a little bit more confident about that, but here we're showing you first in the first column, the endogenous decision, the non-prosecution decision. And we can see, as we saw in the summary statistics, that the endogenous decision is highly correlated with observable case characteristics. But when we instead put ADA leniency on the left-hand side, right, the thing that we hope is plausibly exogenous, it is not statistically significantly correlated or even have large coefficients, right, on any of the observable characteristics that we can see. Right, obviously we can't measure on observable characteristics and we can only hope through our institutional details um, that you know, we're pretty sure that this is going to be exogenous on um, unobservable characteristics as well. So, is it a quick clarifying point? Yeah. The, the residualized ADA leniency you, you you pull out the the, the court by month. Yep, and court by a date. Um, court by date. Right, but, but just Monday, not Monday, two thousand fifteen. Right. But that's but, but that's it. Yeah, that's You're it. Not that's it. Away from the, no, 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 no. We're not. Yeah, yeah. This is exactly. This okay. is when you put in those fixed effects. Yeah, exactly. It takes away everything from yeah, the Yeah, everything. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So that's helpful for us. Okay. Oof. I think I have time. It's 4.45, right? So I have plenty of time. Right. Okay. So I, I do want to make a quick aside 
Um, if you're being very eagle-eyed, you'll notice that there's no demographic characteristics there, which would be very unfortunate uh, given um, this is criminal justice data and that's extremely important. So data is amazing. Unfortunately, demographic characteristics are missing fairly often, not all the time, but fairly often, and more often when a case is not prosecuted, right? The logistical issue is these are paper files that the secretaries then have to enter into the case management system. When the case is not prosecuted, they're just skipping a bunch of rows, right? And so that's unfortunate for us. So for our main analysis, we're going to not going to use age, race, and gender, but those are clearly important. So we'll do two different things. One, we will do the analysis within the set of cases for which we do have age, race, and gender. Right? We're a little bit concerned about sort of the non-random selection and what's missing and what's not, but one of the things that we can do, right? we'll see very similar results. And we've also tried to impute those things from the information that we do have. So race and gender are imputed from name, um, age imputed from like whether this is your first time and some other characteristics of, of the case, uh, the kind of case that you are convicted of. And then we'll see also very similar results when we use those sort of imputations. Um, so they're there in a lot of these appendix tables. Uh, you can find them, but they're not gonna be um, in our main app, unfortunately. Someday they hope to scan the paper files if they can just get like $150,000 or something. Um, so <laughs> if anybody <clears throat> has access to um, a lot of money, <laughs> that they want to give. Okay. Okay. So what about the exclusion restriction? We also need that these kind of leniency is only impacting outcomes for defendants through the non the decision to not prosecute, right? And not do anything else. So one thing that helps us is that the case is assigned to a different ADA um, on the other end. So that individual ADA who was more lenient or less lenient is not making decisions later in the case. Um, one thing we can also look at, there's going to be two things here. I'm going to talk to you about one thing and tell you how I'm now interpreting the other thing a little bit differently. Um, so we can look at, okay, well, conditional on you actually being prosecuted, does the leniency of the ADA that made the initial decision like impact how long your case took to resolve itself? Okay, so we think that if it doesn't, right, that's going to be some evidence for exclusion. We also looked at conviction, but I'm, yeah, I'm going to talk to you about that in just a second. So first in the first panel, we're looking at days to disposition. Right? This is amongst the prosecuted defendants, does the leniency of your ADA have an impact on how many days your case, is, case goes to disposition? Not statistically significantly so, right? Not even very large, 21 over 184 day mean, and if anything positive, right, instead of negative, we might think about it, there's gonna be some positive selection here um, in those cases. We also looked at conviction, but I am less convinced that this has anything to do with exclusion and more convinced that this actually has to do with the, the prosecutor's selection mechanism for cases. Okay, so let's imagine a situation where the prosecutor is only making their decision based on the probability they think this person is going to end up convicted. And the variation in leniency comes from everybody having a different bar above which they are then going to choose to prosecute this individual. If that is the case, we should for sure see a correlation here, right? If you are prosecuted by a lenient ADA, your case is going to be much more likely to be convicted, right? We don't see that. So if, I think that's going to be part and parcel of something that we're going to talk about later, that there's more than just the probability of conviction entering the decision-making process of the prosecutor and or they have bad priors over who's going to get uh, prosecuted. Um, but as we talk about the differences that we're going to see between IV and OLS, this idea is going to come up again about how exactly the prosecutors are making decisions. So we'll return to that. So I'm thinking about this less of exclusion and more about selection. Um, but I think both the institutional details of the case and the one thing that we were able to think about in terms of days to disposition is of some confidence that our exclusion restriction is going to work. <sighs> okay, we also need monotonicity um, in our ADA leniency, right? We need the prosecutors that are more lenient overall, right? Should also be kind of lenient on all sorts of subset of, pro of individuals as well, right? If it, if it was the case that lenient prosecutors tend not to like male defendants, well, that's not really going to work, but tend not to like um, single mom defendants, then we would see that, okay, there's a first stage overall, right? More lenient prosecutors are increasing non-prosecution, but that they wouldn't hold for single mom defendants if on average they tend not to like single mom defendants, even when they were lenient, right? So we would want to see at least to show average monotonicity, right? Those are kind of all average statements that the first stage is positive and significant in all sorts of subsamples, right? A judge that is lenient overall is also lenient, is also increasing prosecution for all kinds of subsamples. That's a test of average monotonicity, um, which we really, really need for late is pairwise monotonicity. There's a new test for that. We can go into a lot of the details if we have time. 
I'm at the end, um, but within six of our nine courthouses, we're also pretty confident that we have pairwise monotonicity as well. But even average monotonicity will get you a correct weighted average that you can basically interpret like a late. But there's a lot of written details in the paper if you want to read all about everything I learned about the econometrics of late. Okay, but in the meantime, I'll show you that these uh, first stages are positive and significant in all sorts of subsamples, one count, greater than one count. Do you have a serious misdemeanor in your um, in your case? What was your previous conviction rate? Are you a citizen? I have no idea what the one that's cut off at the end there is. Uh, what kind of crime were you being charged with? You can also do this within the demographic characteristics um, that we do have, right? That would be one concern. Um, and we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna pass, and that's true for predicted. I think this is actual race, but also true for predicted race. Um, we do predicted race. So, you know, we we feel pretty okay about it. You can still argue back to me that there might be some honesty violations here, but at least on average, we think we're gonna be okay. And then obviously, I've already shown you some evidence that we think the instrument is relevant. Being assigned to a more lenient ADA is actually increasing the probability of non-prosecution. I showed you that in a non-parametric version um, over that histogram. I'll also show you kind of the standard uh, first stage analysis, uh, where this is going to mimic the way we're going to do our results later as well. The left-hand side has no case and defendant covariates in it. The right-hand side does have case and defendant covariates in it. Right, and here we see that at 10 percentage point, being assigned to a, an ADA that is 10 percentage points more lenient is increasing the probability that your case is not prosecuted by about 5.5 percentage points, right? That's 27 percent. Um, over our mean of about 21% non-prosecution, right? And so we see, you know, that clearly being assigned to a more lenient ADA is increasing the probability that your case is not prosecuted. Whew. I'm going to tell pause for a second. How are you guys doing? Okay, it's hot. Okay, Zoom people, how are you? <laughs> You're not very chatty there on Zoom. Okay, so... You know, we feel pretty confident that we've got our late um, kind of assumptions uh, under control. And so we're going to go ahead and run this idea. What is it going to mean results? Okay, focus on the first panel. I know I'm kind of cardinal sin, putting up too much stuff. I really should stop being lazy, cut this slide a little bit more, but here we go. Focus on the first panel, okay? Left-hand side OLS, right-hand side IV. So first let's focus on column four, the IV estimate. Right, our late estimate of the causal impact of non-prosecution for marginal defendants, including all of our case and defendant covariates. Right? What that's telling you is that being non-prosecuted right, decreases the probability you end up with a criminal complaint within two years by 33 percentage points, which is 57 percent over the mean for prosecuted compliers in our particular sample. Right? Large decreases in recidivism for marginal defendants, defendants whose outcomes could actually be impacted by being assigned to a more harsh or less. EDA. So we look at our OLS estimates here in column two with all of our case independent covariance, right? That implies about a 10 percentage point decrease when we use the endogenous kind of non-prosecution decision, right? A much smaller uh, decrease in the probability of recidivism in our OLS estimates than in our IV estimates. What do you think about that? Go ahead. So my prior was actually that the bias is in the yeah. other Yeah, okay. Right? So my prior was that yep. the, when they, you... they select better cases. Yeah, well, yep. no, the, 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 I guess the non-prosecuted, like the, the bias and the non-prosecution yep. was going to pick up. Yep. Like things that were really trivial and didn't really matter yep. versus things that were pretty egregious. And yep. that's what was going to drive it. And then I think if that was the case, then my I was thinking that that would lead to it. Yeah, absolutely. Effect. Absolutely. So that that was, I think, probably our first prior, mm -hmm. right? That we would actually see smaller IV estimates than OLS, right? That we're going to have positive selection right. um, into the cases where maybe they're making decisions on, on non-trivial things. Okay, I should always, I think I should do this slide. Okay, this way. So two, two ways that could happen, right? One is that the impacts for the compliers are just different uh, than, the, than the average defendant. So we're seeing heterogeneity, right? So we re-rate our OLS estimates to look like the compliers. I know I haven't told you how we figure out the characteristics of the compliers. Maybe we'll get to that at some point, right? But no matter how we re-rate this, the OLS estimates all look very similar, right? So we don't think it's heterogeneity. We do think it's about selection. Okay, what's going on? Um, here's how I'm thinking about it. Okay, so this prosecutor is making a decision, uh, potentially on the probability of conviction, but also on something I'm thinking about is culpability. So age is a really salient example of this. Prosecutors are much more likely to not prosecute young defendants, people who are between the ages of 18 and 23, right? They think they deserve a second chance. Maybe they're just not 
culpable for this crime. They're too young to understand whatever. But you know, if you know anything about the criminal legal system, right, younger defendants are much more likely to recidivate. Right, there's just a lot more crime going on between 18 to 23 year olds um, than others. And so that's kind of one, at least observable characteristic example of a place where we have negative selection on the part of prosecutors who are basically choosing to not prosecute quote unquote worse defendants. And you can imagine that there's likely to be unobservable characteristics that are acting the same way, mental health or drug addiction or something like that, that are also serving a similar, uh, similar, whatever that, whatever word I might be looking for. Um, so, um, so that's kind of how we're thinking about this negative selection story that we're seeing in the IV versus OLS. And we think there are actually ways to reconcile the fact that the, the, the IV estimates are, are larger in the OLS estimates and that this kind of negative selection is outweighing some of the positive selection that we might have assumed was going on. What's also interesting to think about here is like one interpretation of that is that they're doing it wrong, right? That they're making bad decisions. And that's a little bit less clear to me. And I know nobody said that. I'm just putting up a straw man and then I get to argue against it. Um, easy, nice thing to do. Um, so like in the bail judge papers, right? Or bail magistrate papers. Bail judges are supposed to be making a decision. They're supposed to be optimizing on the, the probability the defendant fails to appear and or depending on the jurisdiction, the probability the defendant commits another crime pre-trial, right? And then those papers are then measuring the probability the defendant fails to appear or the probability that they commit another crime. In that case, if we saw this sort of negative selection, it would mean the bail judges are doing it wrong, right? Here, that's less clear that recidivism should actually even be entering the prosecutor's decision-making legally. Now, whether it does or doesn't, we don't know. I'm not clear culpability should either, right? Maybe legally they should just be thinking about what do I think, did, did, did this person actually commit, a, is there sufficient evidence that this person committed a crime, right? Um, but recidivism is not necessarily directly in that objective function. And so then I think we don't necessarily interpret them as that they're doing it wrong, right? But that there is some potential negative selection. Thank you for asking. I'll give you the $20 later. Um, okay, so back to this, okay. So we also kind of break this down about whether your complaint was a misdemeanor complaint or a felony complaint. And we see most of the action on another misdemeanor complaint, right? This is really reducing the probability. You end up with another misdemeanor complaint down the line. You know, there's not really a statistically significant impact on felonies, although the point estimate is actually pretty large compared. It's still about 50% um, of the mean for the prosecuted compliers, but we just have a lot. There's just a lot, like I told you, 80% of Criminal charges are misdemeanors, so we just have a lot more power for, for thinking about misdemeanors than thinking about felonies. Okay, I'm gonna skip this time series. I could talk to you about some of the results that I think are really key. Okay, so we then break this down by whether this is essentially a first-time defendant or a repeat defendant. Right, going back to what we were thinking about as potential mechanisms, if we think part of the mechanism is that this basically allows you to avoid the line on your criminal record. Well, that's going to be a lot more impactful for somebody that does not have a criminal record already and they're avoiding getting any line on their criminal record than it may be for somebody who already has a line or two or three or 15, avoiding getting additional one, right? So we're going to define whether you're a first-time defendant in one of three ways. Either do you have any previous complaint in Suffolk County, so do you have any previous row in our data set? Do you have any previous deceitous record? So that's more of a statewide kind of definition. Or maybe do you have any previous conviction if we think that somehow conviction records are going to be more serious for employers than, than just charges? In each case, right, we're seeing that the impacts are large and statistically marginally uh, significant for first time defendants than they are for repeat defendants. And this is particularly true if you think about the baseline means, right? So, you know, point two, maybe you're thinking of that different than point one, but it's actually very different when you're thinking about it in percentage terms. Right, there's going to be in somewhere across these across these kind of columns, there's anywhere between a 65 to 80 percent decline in recidivism for first-time defendants, right? As compared to something like, well, now I can't do the math fast enough. I didn't write the percentage. Oh, 16 percent uh, approximately declines uh, for for second-time defendants that are not statistically significant, right? And so we think this is also part and parcel of the mechanism, right? Or it gives us kind of another story towards this being the potential mechanism that this is really it's leniency for first-time defendants that's really mattering in terms of reducing their future recidivism. For the ones that have already been there, not prosecuting them is not gonna help them that much. Potentially suggestively a little bit. To what extent this impact can be driven by people who seek this prosecution 
and and are so pissed. <laughs> right. I, okay, that could definitely be a mechanism, right? <laughs> there could be like, look, I saw that some of these guys are getting out. Why the hell did I have to go through this? Screw you! I'm gonna go out there and break the windows, and that 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 could be part of the mechanism. That that you know, I, I definitely I definitely cannot rule that. Uh, and, and I think that would just, yeah, again, just be a mechanism and not necessarily against anything that, that we're fighting. Okay. We also look at um, how this is reducing sort of uh, recidivism by the subsequent crime type that you might be um, arrested for. So looking at the first column again. We also interesting, so okay, something I didn't explain to you. We're focusing on nonviolent misdemeanors. Why? One, because that's where the policy relevance really is. But two, because the assignment mechanism for violent cases is just different. Right, there's basically a set of ADAs that, that hear all of the violent cases and they're not this sort of rotation system, so we don't have the same kind of identification for violent cases. But we can look at if you're not prosecuted for a non-violent crime, does that reduce the probability you end up there for a violent crime? It actually does, right? Maybe because now the non-prosecuted people are less pissed and they're not going out and beating people up uh, like immediately, right? And also reducing uh, motor vehicle charges and just sort of theft charges a little bit less on drug and then other is hard to explain there's nothing going on there but it's also such a hodgepodge category that it's a little bit hard to break apart yeah what uh, so how does the variation of the DC compare in these subcategories so are there some that's kind of what yeah go ahead so, so like the ADAs, are they you know with first time offenders that are clustered at the bottom or um, is there kind of more spread like are some ADAs just it's a good question so Again, we, we didn't do like the whole full distribution by these subcategories. One thing we have done is calculate the instruments as ADA by crime type or ADA by first time versus repeat offendants. Then now we're looking, you're only comparing the leniency within first time cases for an ADA using that leniency within second time cases or, or beyond. And we see very similar results when we do that. But what we haven't done is kind of just compare this distribution of leniency by first time versus second time defendants or by crime type, which I think we should do. Like it would be interesting to understand how much variation we actually have. But is everybody just pretty lenient on first time defendants? And what does that mean? Um, so I get, my guess is no, just because we do see similar um, IV results uh, for those interacted um, IV uh, instruments, but we haven't actually looked at it. That's a good question. Okay. So, you know, again, and then and Joe brought this up before, like what we have is a local average treatment. Right, we're, we're not, we can't estimate here an average treatment effect. We can estimate the marginal, um, the, the causal impact for the compliers, for the marginal defendants, right? Who are those marginal defendants? What do they look like? What proportion of the sample are they? Right, so we'll use sort of standard techniques from the literature, um, which I can tell you more about, or you can read the uh, appendix uh, example in the very back. I think it's like the last couple of pages. Um, but we're going to estimate that about 11% of our sample are compliers, these sort of marginal defendants. This is pretty standard for the kind of judge IV literature. You usually get somewhere between eight and seventeen percent of the sample being compliers, right? A lot of the a lot of the just never takers, obviously. A lot of the sample are never takers, those sort of people that are always going to be prosecuted, no matter who they get assigned to. Um, you know, a, a, a smaller, similar chunk of always takers, always going to be non-prosecuted, just no matter who they get assigned to. So, you know, it's a it's a it's a substantial chunk of the sample, about one in ten of our our defendants are compliant, but it's not necessarily applying to everything. Right? This is still going to be a relatively specific, um, although we think, again, policy relevant uh, treatment effect. So we can also use kind of similar math uh, to understand what the characteristics of the compliers are. Right. And so here we're showing you the average characteristics for all of the cases. And this is the, the kind of proportion amongst the compliers. This is kind of how different they are. Right. So the compliers are less likely to have a serious misdemeanor. That's a misdemeanor that's eligible for more than six months in jail as part of their case. They're more likely to be citizens, less likely to um, have a conviction um, in their prior, uh, in the prior year, um, and less likely to be, oh, maybe this kind of answers part of the question. They're less likely to be drug crimes, um, but by similarly likely to be just really theft crimes. And so it's these weights that we then use in kind of reweight our OLS estimates to look more like the compliers, when we try to understand whether the differences between OLS and IV were about heterogeneity or about selection. So this I already showed you, and this we talked through already. Uh, so in terms of thinking about mechanisms, I have basically described to you like through here what we think the main mechanism is, right? But we think there's kind of three potential mechanisms going on here, well, possibly more, but three that we can really think through kind of easily. Is one, this non-prosecution is protecting defendants from a lengthy prosecution generally. So even, even though it turns out something I think I didn't tell you yet, 
75% of the prosecuted cases are eventually dismissed. These are not leading to convictions. They're not leading to incarceration or fines or punishment. They're eventually dismissed, but they still take on average 180 days to resolve themselves. That's 180 days in which you might have to go to court on any given day and you have to show up, right? You're coming, I watch these hearings, they're awful. They call the person up, they've been sitting in the courtroom for two hours. The, the lawyer asks for a continuance. The judge says, okay, and the person now has to leave and come back in three weeks. And they've already been there for three hours and probably lost work for the day, right? And so you might be losing your job already. A pending charge shows up on a criminal background check no matter what. So in Massachusetts, so, so like that's that's going to be affecting you whether your charge, whether your case is going to be dismissed or not, right? So we've got that protection. You don't have to deal with all of that, right? You might be able to keep your job. Uh, you don't have to deal with all of this coming in. Of course, some of them are going to be convicted. So you are protecting these defendants from eventually having a conviction record. About a quarter of them will get under the conviction record and the potential punishment that might come with that, which is mostly not incarcerated. Remember, these are nonviolent misdemeanor crimes. That is also to say that we don't think incapacitation um, of any kind is going to be driving um, any of our results. And as I mentioned before, one of the biggest things is we have a large reduction in the probability that this case ends up in the decedent's record, right? So amongst the prosecuted cases, 99% of them are ending up in the DCGIS database. There's some just problems with the merge, I think. My guess is most of them are actually there, right? But we reduce that by over 50, by over 50 percent when you are not prosecuted. Because remember, there's that iffy part about the arraignment hearing. So even a not prosecuted case could end up with a line there if it gets past arraignment, right? But we're reducing that probability by 50 percent, which we again think of as one of the driving mechanisms. Unfortunately, we can't test that yet. We've had an application into the Massachusetts Department of Labor for like the last year. They apparently have other things to do right now um, than trying to, to, to merge um, our data so we can really understand the impacts on employment. Um, but it's hopefully something that we'll be able to do at some point in the future. Okay, so non-prosecution for these marginal defendants is leading to a lower probability of future recidivism. But of course, these findings only apply to the marginal misdemeanor defendants that make about 11% of our sample, right? Well, we might want to move beyond that a little bit. Right? We might want to move beyond these late estimates um, and start thinking about what's going to happen with larger expansions of leniency. So we're going to think about this in two ways. The first is we'll estimate marginal treatment effects. Basically, if we're thinking about different changes along the leniency distribution, right, going from a uh, for, excuse me, an ADA um, who is 5% lenient to 6% lenient, it's going to be pulling in a different set of marginal cases than going from an, an ADA that's 25% like lenient to one that's 26% lenient. Right, And so we can start thinking about kind of lining up these ADAs by their, their leniency and then looking at what happens to the recidivism of marginal defendants along each of these margins. Right, And we're going to find that that is negative downward sloping, sort of continued evidence of that sort of negative selection that we were talking about before. Right, And it sort of implies that if we were to expand leniency more, we might actually be further reducing recidivism um, rather than exacerbating. Uh, things. It's not like U-shaped, where maybe when we get to higher levels of, of non-prosecution, we seem to be increasing. Um, recidivism, of course, we don't have quite as much data out here in the tails of the distribution, so it's going to be noisier out there, but at least it gives us some indication that larger expansions of leniency aren't necessarily going to be exacerbated recidivism. The other thing we'll do, as I mentioned kind of earlier, um, is we will study the impact of Rachel Rollins' inauguration on January actually, it was 2nd, 2019. Right? She ran on a platform of presumptive non-prosecution for nonviolent misdemeanor crimes. Okay, so January 2019, that's kind of a problem, right? Because we're going to look at recidivism. Uh, so we're only going to be looking at one year recidivism. We're going to kind of have a, a small number of cases that we can really study uh, before COVID happens and the whole world shuts down and, and everything. Uh, but at least we can look at some suggestive evidence about what happens after her inauguration. Okay. So what I'm showing you here first is non-prosecution, average non-prosecution rates before and after her inauguration for nonviolent misdemeanors on the left and nonviolent felonies on the right, right? So here's where you're going to see kind of an idea of what our estimation strategy is going to look like, right? We're going to be thinking about differences and differences, basically, uh, between these nonviolent misdemeanors where we see large increases um, in non-prosecution after her um, inauguration with some time series patterns in them, right? But on average, some, um, so large increases in non or, some increases in non-prosecution, not to 100%, right? We told you this is a presumption of non-prosecution, 
the default shipping non-prosecution, we're pushing leniency in one direction, right? but we're not necessarily completely obliterating charging for these types of crimes. No changes for nonviolent felonies. Okay, so then let's focus on the bottom sort of rows. So on the left hand side, I'm showing you basically the same thing. Here is the uh, nonviolent misdemeanors relative to nonviolent felonies, right? We're seeing large increases in non prosecution. Sorry, I'm the, the, is he explaining the other ones are kind of unnecessary right now. So I should have just shown you these. So let's focus here on this one. Um, nonviolent misdemeanors relative to nonviolent felonies increasing significantly, non prosecution rates when you use that sort of control. You saw that already, here, right? There was basically no change um, in non prosecution for the nonviolent felonies increases. So you're going to see in the difference in difference. Um, some increases as well. And then on the right hand side, we're looking at what happens to you getting a subsequent complaint within one year. So a little bit different than within two years, right? The top is not difference in difference, the bottom is difference in difference um, using that kind of control group. So noisy estimates, but still suggestive evidence of reductions in recidivism of a similar magnitude as we were seeing with that kind of marginal cases analysis that we were doing previously, right? Or at the very least, the way I think about this is we don't see any evidence that things went to hell after she was inaugurated, that suddenly there was large increases in recidivism after she was inaugurated, right? Instead, if anything, we still see suggestive evidence of reductions, even with this expansion of leniency after her election. So move us a little bit beyond the lead. Uh, but of course, what we've been studying this whole time is what happens to the individual defendant that experiences a non-prosecution effect, right? What you might also be worried about when you implement a policy like a presumption of non-prosecution is broader general equilibrium effects on crime rates, right? That's what you're hearing in the news. That's what a lot of the police are sort of bringing up about a lot of these policies is look, you're just increasing crime by doing this because now everybody thinks they can go out there and do that with impunity. This is a tough question to get at, right? So what we're gonna show you next is purely descriptive right, and suggestive. We're collecting a little bit more data on this across several jurisdictions, but we have done is gotten crime reporting data from the Boston Police Department for, well, all crimes, but we're focusing here on the set of crimes that were like announced as her presumptive non-prosecution crimes. These sort of low level property and drug misdemeanors. What we're showing here is reports to the Boston Police Department of these types of crimes, interrupted time series, so very descriptive. Right? But again, it's not that we're seeing these large jumps in reports for property damage, theft and fraud, drug crimes, or anything like that after this presumption of non-prosecution goes into effect, right? Even eight, oh gosh, I think that's months. I have to, you have to forgive me, but it might be two months. But anyways, even eight months, right, after her inauguration. Now, there's kind of an issue here, but many issues. Um, but one major issue is that this is a reported crime. And you might expect that part of the general equilibrium effect is that people are not going to report crimes if they think the prosecutor is not going to charge them. We don't have anything clever to say about that yet, right? I wish we did. Um, you know, I think I talked to one or two of you um, about our idea, maybe to try to contact some of these retailers and get like retail shrinkage data, right? Or something that's outside of reporting. Like you could imagine something like shot spotter, which would be useless here because murderers are not being not prosecuted, right? But something like that, where you have some measure of crime that is completely separate from reporting, is going to be pretty key to understanding this phenomenon. We're also, of course, going to want longer run analyses as well, right? It's going to take a while. Like, yes, she ran on presumption of non-prosecution. I bet you if I asked the general person in, in Boston who the DA is, what they ran on and what's currently being non-prosecuted, they have zero idea, right? So it's going to take a while for this information to sort of kind of flow to people as they start to learn, hey, my buddy didn't get prosecuted for this particular crime. Maybe I can try it. Oh, look, I didn't get prosecuted either. So we might also want longer run effects, which we're a little bit stymied at doing here. Again, because we have COVID happen not that long after she gets inaugurated. So what? Are there any measures of sort of private investments in security? Mm. Cool. That could be interesting as well. Yeah, I'm not sure. Like I, I haven't seen them, but I also haven't like dug into this really as much um, as we might want to. Do you have any quick ideas about where 
one might start thinking about looking at that. No, but I mean, that's a, it got me thinking about sort of the anecdotal stories yeah. of sort of CBS and kind of the rest right. of whether, you know, people grab and stuff off the shelf. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They think they're going to, you know. Right, so maybe like, stay. yeah, employment of security guards. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, I would have to look. No, because it's interesting because well, basically well, part of what we're doing now as an extension of this study is we've collected data from um, a bunch of jurisdictions that had these sorts of policies. Um, so we can start looking at this question in more of a difference in different style um, analysis, but then we'd also like to look at other outcome measures in reported crimes. So we're just sort of starting to push on this side of things, but that's going to speak directly to what you're hearing, like stories coming out of San Francisco of stores shutting down because um, people are stealing a lot. And there's still a question about whether this is truly a causal impact of those policies or media sensationalism. That is a, a question to you. How does Boudin's policy compare to Boston? So I, my understanding is that Boudin is more lenient. Um, like there's more of a presumption um, in terms of that non-prosecution. Although a lot of what's being blamed is more like the Prop 47 thing where they like reduced um, felony theft above $950 to a misdemeanor instead of a felony. First of all, that happened many years ago. And like in the same story that said that, they talked about a guy who stole $1,000 worth of stuff from Walgreens. Like, well, that's a felony, <laughs> like whether or not. But, but, but my best understanding of his policies is they actually have a stronger component of that's more nice. of a presumption, let's say, a bigger change in the and so that might, I mean, that's why. Does any, any jurisdiction? Sorry, what was that? San Francisco probably has. Has the most lenient laws. I mean, I think George Gascon in Los Angeles would like to do the same thing. Uh, but um, I don't know how successful that he, he has been. Um, but yeah, that's why we're trying to collect this information sort of from across jurisdictions to kind of get a better idea. Because both the expansions of leniency might be bigger and smaller in these jurisdictions. And that will help us get a little bit more about this kind of, what is the margin? Uh, Kind of what is the difference when this margin is a little bit different in this change? So not great answers for you here, but like here, like it's not like here we're seeing again some huge increase in crime reporting after this large expansion of leniency, right? And so it does seem on first glance, at first blush descriptively, um, that we don't see the sort of costs that law enforcement might have been concerned about. So that's what I had for you today. Um, Non-prosecution of misdemeanors leads to reduce future criminal justice contact for marginal misdemeanor defendants. But both our MTE estimates and our analysis of the extension of presumptive non-prosecution by DA Rollins right, indicate that further expansions of leniency may actually be further reducing recidivism without increasing crime. But obviously, I would say more research is needed before we all stop prosecuting on nonviolent misdemeanors. Thank you. And I welcome your questions in the last couple minutes that we have, including from those of you on Zoom. <laughs> quiet, quiet people. Any final questions? Thank you so right. much. Well, stay for just one second. Sorry, we have to sing for our supper here at the center. It seems like a good day to get a nice photograph. So, can would you mind joining? Us yeah, sitting sure. Here? Russ, you want to take a photo from the, from the top, and you can feel free to fill in the chair at the, at the table. And just snap a shot from the front, Russ. Oh, from the front. Yes. Um, yes. Thank you. I appreciate. It. You just in the back. It's a massive line. What? Oh, that's a good question. Just mask on. Yeah, you might get in trouble. Maybe you get in trouble if, like, you have to say that. That's a great one. Yeah. Yeah. Until you say it. Make sure you smile under your mask. Yes. Everybody yeah. smile with your eyes. Smile. Smile. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Cool. So I was going to say, I was talking while you took that picture, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> as long as you were talking with your eyes. Yes, um, yes. Marianne Page will be joining us next week from UC Davis. It will be uh, via Zoom when she's going to talk about social uh, safety net programs. Look forward to next week. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. 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 Thank you.